right? Let's all stand together as we sing. Cry on him with many cries. Beside still waters, he restores my soul, he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, make sure to check your emails regularly for updates and announcements. If you're not receiving any emails, uh, please contact ministryadmin at gbcmd.com. We do have Bible studies um, going on through Zoom conferencing on Sundays at 9 a.m. and also Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. You can access this by the email link or on the church website at gbcmd.com. In regards to offering, we do have an offertory box up here, or you can uh, give at uh, gbcmd.com as well. Um, and also, you can follow along the message at home or in church. Uh, go on YouVersion Bible app, uh, you click on the three lines, the bottom right hand corner. Click on events and look up Germantown Baptist Church. In addition, the uh, lyrics for the worship songs are on the app as well. Let's all stand once again as we sing, Open Up the Heavens. Waiting for this day, 
We've gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening the desire would burn our hearts with truth. It's a 
presence in our life, we pray that you would reveal truth to our hearts, that your word would be embedded into our brains and our thinking, our very being, that we would know your heart, that your spirit would speak to us through that word, you would guide us in your ways. We pray that each one of us would acknowledge you as our cornerstone, that you are the very foundation of our lives. And Father, we pray, just as this last song declared, that let your name be the glory and the passion of the church. We pray that you would revive your people, that you would call us out to be the light that you've called us to be, to be the salt in this earth, to actually stand up for what's right and declare your truth and your salvation to the nations. And we pray that that declaration would begin in our own families, in our own communities. We pray for your intervention. We pray for your presence to be strong in our life, in our communities, that we would glorify you and honor you in all things. We pray that you would bless this day. We pray for those who are at home and can't be here. We pray that uh, your spirit would pour out blessings upon their homes. We pray that we would intercede uh, for each other through times of difficulty. That we would, even by distance, still be able to hold each other accountable. To encourage each other to walk in your ways. We dedicate this time to you. We dedicate our hearts to you. We pray that you speak to us mightily. We pray
pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again to all of you. Uh, good morning to those who are at home. Um, this week we're going to finish what we started two weeks ago. Uh, so if you didn't see two weeks ago, go back home real quick and watch that and then come back and we'll start part two. Um, let's just kind of get you caught up to where we are, uh, where we left off a couple weeks ago. Uh, there are basically four progressions that we're going to look at in uh, this text, and it's a text that we're actually going through uh, an expository teaching on Wednesday night. So we're looking at each word, each verse, uh, one by one, and seeing what God's word has to say to us. And, and um, I wanted to share some of these thoughts with us today. Uh, the progression that we started last week, uh, we, or two weeks ago, we, we saw two of these foundations. And uh, taken from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, basically. But uh, the first progression is, when we come to Christ, he becomes our cornerstone. When we come to Christ, he becomes our cornerstone. He is our foundation. If you don't line up to him, then your foundation will not be square. It will not stand. Secondly, the progression goes, if he's our cornerstone, then we are his construction project. If he has placed us, then he's the one who's building us. He's building us into what he wants us to be, not our design. So that brings us to our third progression this week, number three. If we, if we are his construction, then we have a divine purpose. You're not here by accident. There is a creator to the creation. There is a designer to the design. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, we're looking at verses 9 and 10 today. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Some translations have peculiar people, and that we are. His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And on Wednesday night, as we went through this, you see that all these phrases were a, a characterization. They were a picture of ancient Israel and their calling. And we see that God has, has, had, has given the same calling to his church, that we become the light, uh, that we take this word, out into the nations. So as we look at our divine purpose and looking at uh, these previous two progressions, some of us tend to forget that we are God's construction project. We think that we're a self-made person. We have our own agenda. We have our own designs and we are building our own kingdom. You may remember a couple of weeks ago we were talking about uh, Michelangelo and, and having this uh, Gigante, this, this giant uh, piece of marble. And he basically said you have to cut away, uh, chip away the parts that are not part of the sculpture. And that's exactly what God is doing to us. He's chipping away those things that do not belong. And just like at the quarry uh, that uh, in Jerusalem where they been, built the temple, they went to the quarry and they cut each stone precisely to fit at the quarry and then brought it to the temple mount and place them where they belonged. They were cut with perfection and set perfectly with the cornerstone. So some of us forget that we are God's construction project, that he's building us. And his design, at least for us accumulatively, is that he's building us into his spiritual house. You notice in Jerusalem, there's no temple standing. That was destroyed in 70 AD. And that has been gone physically during the age of the church. And we, the church, are now his spiritual house, his temple here on earth. 
And so in regards to that, we have to remember that since we're his spiritual house, since we are his temple, then we have to do what the temple did. And that is offer up sacrifices to God. Uh, Romans 12 basically says we are to offer up ourselves as living sacrifices. And some of us fail to understand that he traded, Jesus traded our death for his life. There's a big trade. He took what we deserve and he gave us what we didn't deserve. He traded our death for his life and now the life that we live, as Paul would say, we live for Christ. Big trade. Took our sin, nailed it to his cross, took his righteousness and imparted it, imputed it to our account so that when God looks at us, when God sees us now, he doesn't see our sin, but he sees the righteousness of Christ. That's a good deal, isn't it? Sometimes we forget that we are God's construction, we are God's building project, and we focus on what we are building. We are building our kingdom rather than the kingdom of God. Uh, keeping your place in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, but looking at 1 Chronicles 17, 1 Chronicles 17 verse 1. Listen to what David says. Now it came to pass when David was dwelling in his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, uh, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under tent curtains. Basically, David came into Jerusalem, set up the kingdom, built his palace, and he was very comfortable. And as he is living in the comfort of his own building, he saw that the ark of God was in a tent. Thinking about the same thing after the Babylonian exile, after, after the first temple was already destroyed, and after Israel had been taken captive for 70 years, God brought them back to rebuild. And listen to what's said in Haggai, Haggai chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. They did the exact same thing that David did. David came to Jerusalem, conquered it, made it its capital, and David finished his palace, but left the covenant, Ark of the Covenant, in a tent. And God brought Israel back to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. And the first thing they did was rebuild their homes. Not just rebuild them, but made them paneled. It's an upgrade. It's luxury. And... Their focus was on them, their building project, not God's building project. And I think the same thing is mirrored by us today. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty about your homes. Your homes are probably in good shape. Your homes are probably beautiful. Uh, they're probably much newer uh, than this building. And even though this building could use an extreme, an extreme makeover, I don't think that this is what God's talking about in regards to a physical building. The building that is lacking today is basically the same building that was lacking in the day of Haggai, in the day of the, the temple uh, in, in David's day wanting to be constructed. And that is, we focus on our building projects, not God's. And what is God's building project today? Well, it's the church. It's the church. How do you build the church? Well, you build it just like you did the old temple. You take stones from the quarry 
They had to be cut and then placed in order to make a building. But Peter has told us that you and I are living stones. God takes from his quarry, he chisels away the parts that don't belong, and he brings us together, and he builds up his house. I like what it said in 1 Kings 5.17. It says, At the king's command, they removed from the quarry large blocks of quality stone to provide a foundation of dressed stone for the temple. So the stones that were used to build the temple, they were taken from a quarry that was close in proximity to the Temple Mount. So those quarries became known as temple quarries. That meant anything that was taken from the temple quarry had to be put into the temple. It couldn't be used for any other project. Hmm. Does that apply to you and I? If God has taken you from his quarry and he has chiseled you and he has cut you uh, and, and shaped you to fit in his temple, you cannot be placed in any other place. You cannot be any, a part of any other construction project. You are holy to the Lord. And so when we are cut from God's quarry to be put into his spiritual house, and then we go and make our own building project, you have no foundation. It will fall. Guaranteed. It reminds us of this third imperative. If we are his construction, then we have a divine purpose. A divine purpose. You're no longer common. You're no longer to be used for the world's pleasure, but for God's pleasure. Ephesians 1 verse 11. Listen to uh, a repeated uh, uh, theme in Ephesians 1. In him, you were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purposes of his will, <laughs> not our plans, in order that we who were, the first, who were the first to hope in Christ, and here's the phrase I want you to, to circle or, or remember, that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. <clears throat> you are saved for no other reason than for the glory of God. I know that sounds kind of strange. You're thinking, well, I'm saved because I deserve to be saved. No. <laughs> you and I weren't. We don't deserve to be saved. That's what makes grace amazing. You're saved. Jesus shed his blood for the praise of his glory. Not for us. In verse 13, it goes on, it says, And you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guarantee in our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. You are God's possession now. And then it says, once again, to the praise of his glory. Isaiah 43, verse 7. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. I have formed him, yes, I have made him. If we are his construction, we have a divine purpose. It's for his name. God created us for his glory, not for ours. We did not make God in our image. He made us in his. Do you realize that God didn't even need us? You aren't here because God needed you. He wasn't lonely. He, was, he wasn't incomplete without us. He wasn't bored. You and I are simply an expression of who God is. The Bible tells us that God is love. Well, love demands something. Love demands to be shared. And that's why God created us. For his glory. But mankind is self-centered, aren't we? Our biggest failure, our biggest pitfall is our pride. 
Somewhere along the way, we've come up with the idea that we're here for our glory. We're determined to make a name for ourselves. You go back to the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. What they want to do is let us make a name for ourselves. And that has been man's cry all throughout the ages. Let me make a name for myself. I want to leave a mark on this world. We've become so wrapped up in ourselves that we find it very difficult to even believe that God created us from dirt. How offensive is that? God made you from dirt. One of the deacons in my last church worked uh, in a hazmat company. And oftentimes he'd have to go to clean up a crime scene. And uh, sometimes that crime scene would contain a dead body. And in his paperwork, he told me that there's a place to list the value of everything at the crime scene. Everything of value. And then there's an area about that has human remains. And he has to put in a monetary value for human remains. And it was less than $12. And the reason for that, it might be different now, but the reason for that is because he said that they only value the mineral content within the human body. And the mineral con content within you is about $12. Why? Because you're made of dirt. Yep. It's more dignified to think that we evolved. That we're a progression. That Everything before us is lesser, and now we are greater because we have evolved. We like to think that we evolved from a one-cell organism to a fish, to a reptile, to a monkey, to a man. I wonder what we'll evolve into next. What's our next stage of evolution? I think we'd really be bummed if our next stage of evolution was a dung beetle. Evolution's sole purpose is to completely remove God from the equation. Because if we evolved, then we were not created, which means that we're here by accident and there's no purpose for anything or anybody. And if this is all a big accident, a big bang, then we're not accountable to anyone especially any God. I don't know about you, but I believe what the Bible says, that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am no accident. God has a plan. And we read this in Sunday school this morning. God says, I knew you while you were still in your mother's womb. I called you from your mother's womb. Apart from God, apart from his word, it is impossible for me to know my purpose. And it's impossible for me to find meaning in life. There's a story of a remote tribe in the Amazon. And from what I understand, there are still tribes in the Amazon that have never seen modern people. It's pretty amazing. But uh, there's this one particular tribe some of the tribesmen were out hunting and they found a camp of uh, modern hikers that they'd left behind and they abandoned a few things and among the things that they left behind was a hammer. And so they took the hammer back to their, their chief, the chief of the tribe, and he examined the hammer for a while and he couldn't figure out what it was for. Couldn't understand what the purpose of it was. So for 20 years he simply used the hammer as a back scratcher. How many of us are like that hammer, though? We were created, we were designed for a purpose to glorify God. And if you do not know God, if you do not know the designer of the design, you don't know why you were created. And what you are is a big back scratcher. You do not fulfill your purpose until you know the one who created you. I believe there are three types of people in the world. Three types of people, very simple. 
There's unfulfilled people who do not know their purpose. They don't know God. They don't know their purpose. And there are unfulfilled people who know their purpose, but they don't do it. They're defiant. They're rebellious. And finally, there are fulfilled people who know their purpose and they strive to live it. 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9. There's an old story about a lighthouse keeper. And um, he worked a very uh, dark stretch of coastline. And once a month, he would receive an oil supply to keep the light burning in the lighthouse. It was before electricity. So he had that oil to keep the lamp burning. And uh, like I said, it's sent monthly. And over the course of the month, he had different requests from the villagers. You know, a woman wanted uh, some oil to uh, help keep her family warm. Another, uh, another farmer came in and asked for oil for his lamps. And somebody else needed oil for their machinery. And so throughout the course of the month, he, uh, he gave the oil out because he felt like these were valid needs. And towards the end of the month, he realized that his supply of oil was diminished, and finally it was gone. So one night, the light in the lighthouse went out. As a result, several ships crashed into the the coast. Lives were lost. Investigation was done. And the authorities questioned him, and he was very apologetic, uh, apologetic. He told them that he was just trying to be helpful to his community by giving out the oil. Their reply to his his excuses were very simple and to the point. They said, you were given oil for one purpose and one purpose only, to keep that light burning. That's it. I think the same thing is true with us. We are called to keep the light burning. There are many pursuits In this world, there are many voices that call out to us. Yet our purpose can only be defined by the one who created us. We cannot obey the other voices that are telling us what to do. We have to obey the voice of our God. So this third aspect, if we are his construction project, we have a divine purpose. Within the text in 1 Peter chapter 2, especially verse 9, there's only, one, uh, there's only one purpose given in the midst of all of this. Look at verse 9 again. Here's the whole reason that God has called you out, that he has shaped you, he has chiseled away the parts that don't belong, that he has made you into his spiritual house. And it's for this reason alone, that you may proclaim. I love this word in the, in the Greek, it's ex angelo. Ek means out. Anglo is message. So you have to get the message out. That you may get the message out. The praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's it. Why has God called you out of darkness? Why has he redeemed you and saved you? So that you may get the message out. Proclaim his praises. So let's look at our progression again. Number one, when we come to Christ, he becomes our cornerstone. Everything is built upon him as the foundation, connected to him as the foundation. Number two, if he is our cornerstone, we are his construction project. That means our lives are no longer about our pursuits, but his, we are building his kingdom, not ours. Number three, if we're his If we are his construction project, we have a divine purpose. That means it's all about him, it's not about me. It's his plan. It's his design, not mine. And finally, number four, if we have a divine purpose, then he gets all the glory. He gets all the praise. Because you and I could never save ourselves. We can never call ourselves out of darkness. We can never chisel away the parts that don't belong. We can never pick ourselves out of the pit. We can never bring to life that which was dead. Only God can. 
So this last aspect, this last progression, if we have a divine purpose, he gets all the glory. How well are you doing that right now? How much glory do you give to him? How much glory do you give to yourself? Try to imagine, picture in your mind what hell and what the eternal lake of fire would be like. The Bible tells us that there's weeping, there's an unquenchable thirst, there's darkness, there's gnashing of teeth, there is unbelievable torment. In fact, the Hebrew used to call it the place of torments. And as you envision this place, try to picture it as a place where God's presence never dwells. That's why it's dark. And the worst part about this place is not the thirst, it's not the hunger, it's not the pain, not the torments, it's not the darkness. The worst part of this place is there's no hope for those who are there. No hope. Conditions will never change. It is eternal. And then picture yourself having all eternity to go over your sins one by one and reliving your guilt for ages and ages. It's pretty horrific to think about. Now having pictured what you and I deserve, that's what we should get. Now picture what grace and mercy through Christ has provided. You're in a place of unspeakable joy. Peace literally flows like a river. There are no sounds of crying, no despair, no sorrow, no depression. There's no fear of anything at all. In fact, you feel the safest you've ever felt or thought, ever thought you could imagine feeling. And you remember the beauties of earth and this creation, but now this new creation is surpassing the old creation as you experience God's new heaven and new earth, and you're literally stunned by the majesty of this place in perfection. And with the beauty of the place, it gets even better as you begin to speak to those who are there. And they're all there for the same reason. The grace of Christ. The blood of Christ. And they share their testimonies with you. And you all have that in common. And then finally, you hear his voice. The very voice that whispered your name and called you to salvation. And you turn to see the one who took your place on the cross. Immediately you think of what you deserve. And you wonder, why am I here? Why didn't I get what I deserved? And Jesus simply says, you didn't get what you deserve because I got what I didn't deserve. And in that moment, you realize the only reason that you have entered this place, the only reason that you're part of the new creation, the only reason that you're in his presence is because of him. Is because he called you out of the darkness into this place. With that Finish with that reality. Can you fully comprehend that phrase now? That we proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Tell you what. If you knew how far he brought you from to where he's taken you to. You have to proclaim his praises. Ephesians 2 verse 4. We were dead in sin. We were dead in our trespasses. Verse 4 says, But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. 
and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, all the way into eternity, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. See, the only thing that changes the equation from what you deserve to what God is giving you is Christ. If you take Jesus out of the equation, every single one of us, every person who's ever lived, will experience darkness perpetually. But Christ has given us life. So the question is, with this last progression, are you proclaiming the praises of the one who's called you out of darkness into that marvelous light? Are you exangelos? Are you getting the message out of what he's done for you? We all deserve to be left in the darkness, but he's called us into light. In fact, uh, it's described as marvelous light. Marvelous, wonderful, some translations have. The word is thromastas. Thromastas means beyond human comprehension. You can't even think about it. You can't even fathom it. You couldn't even have an artist give a rendering of it because it's beyond our thought capability. So let's come back and let's look at all of these added together. Number one, when we come to Christ, he becomes our cornerstone. Number two, if he's our cornerstone, then we are his construction project. Number three, if we are his construction project, we have a divine purpose. And finally, if we have a divine purpose, then it's him who gets all the glory. Amen? Let's pray. Father, so often we are not a grateful people. So often we are busy building our own kingdom. We're busy looking at our own agenda, pursuing our own desires. We pray this morning that you would open our eyes to our ways, that your spirit would draw us ever closer to yourself. And Father, we pray that we would understand the darkness that you called, it, called us out of, that that's exactly what all of us deserve. But it's by your grace, your mercy, your love for us, and it's for your glory alone that you call us out of that darkness into your presence. And for that, we will proclaim your goodness and your glory for ages to come. Help us be a grateful people. Help us be mindful of the sacrifice that has been given to us. And Father, let us, let us constantly make sure that our foundation is the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. And that we are lined up perfectly with that cornerstone. And our foundation is strong. May you build upon it those things which are eternal. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our, our song of response. Let the saving love of Christ be the name.
When this fantasy world is over, we will see you face to face, and forever we will Jesus, you are to us. Jesus, you are to us. Amen. Brother Aubrey, would you mind closing us in prayer? Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.